Welcome back to the TED Med at CDC. Our next presenter is Dr. Ursula Bauer. She's the director of CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, a position that she has held since 2010. Her topic today is Culture is Prevention, Overcoming Trauma and Nurturing Resilience Through Identity and Connection to Culture. Dr. Bauer. Good morning. I've had the privilege uh, during my time at CDC to spend time with American Indians and Alaska Natives on their land, in their homes, with their government, and in dialogue. As impressed as I've been with the challenges they face, I've been more impressed with the drive to thrive on their own terms. As overwhelming as the challenges may seem in Indian country, the solutions are there too, growing from within. I'm going to talk about trauma and resilience uh, among American Indians and Alaska Natives in the context of names. Names say a lot about uh, who we are, both positive and negative. When Michelle Obama welcomed a group of American Indian and Alaska Native youth to the White House this summer, she talked about all the beautiful places in our country and how our language, English, lacked the words to describe these. So we used the indigenous names, Alaska, Connecticut, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska. That's a positive aspect of names. But there's a negative aspect as well, and uh, I'm not even going to mention the R word. We have a, a saying that we learn in our culture when we're very young, um, and by we, I mean white Americans of European ancestry. If I give you the first line, I'm sure you can give me the second line. Sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me. That's the way I learned uh, the saying. Um, names uh, say a lot about who we are, and names have characterized the adversarial relationship that we've had with American Indians and Alaska Natives over our entire uh, history. Navajo, for example, is a Spanish adaptation of a Zuni Pueblo phrase, Apache de Navajo, uh, where Apache means enemy and Navajo means farms in the valley. To the Zuni Pueblo and thus to the Spanish and then to us, the Navajo were the enemy who farmed in the valley and the people we came to call Apache were the other enemy who lived to the north. The Navajo and the Apache uh, each have a word for themselves, and that word means people. Pequot is derived from a Narragansett word, meaning invader or destroyer. Comanche is derived from an oot phrase, meaning the ones who hate everyone. Sioux is a French corruption of an Ojibwe word, meaning snake, referring to their enemy. And Iroquois is a French corruption of an Algonquin word, meaning snake, referring to their enemy. The Pequot, Comanche, and Iroquois have a name for themselves in their own languages. It means people. <laughs> and the Sioux have a word for themselves. It means allies or friends. I could go on, but you get the picture. Throughout the 21st century, we Americans are still referring to our fellow citizens by names they never called themselves. These names are on our treaties, they're in our government documents, they're in our official correspondence, they're on our CDC cooperative agreements. They're in our everyday speech. So even with something as basic as a name, we're still defining who people are, and it's not the way the people define themselves. If you think that these names and languages that few people understand don't convey their original meaning, consider this study of kindergarten students in Minneapolis. Over three quarters of them had negative views of Indians, and of those, 25% use these terms to describe Indians, enemy, killer, mean, I don't like them. 
Here's another aspect uh, of name. <laughs> My colleague uh, Chris Percy says, if you ask a Navajo grandmother how to prevent heart disease, she'll tell you it begins with the naming. Now, does she mean it begins in infancy, which is something I understand, and something around which I can build a logic model that begins at birth and ends with a lower risk of heart disease? Or does she mean it begins with culture, with the communal act of welcoming a new person into the world and among the people, which is something I understand less or not at all, and around which it's almost impossible to build a medical model of discrete uh, cause and effect all driving toward a lower risk of heart disease. That failure of understanding marks the entire history of our relationship with the people, with American Indians and Alaska Natives. And that failure, our failure, manifests itself today in a tremendous amount of trauma uh, that uh, reflects as poor uh, health and social outcomes, uh, for example. But as brutal as that failure has been, it has not extinguished an extraordinary resilience, which I'll talk about in a minute. The willful lack of understanding is particularly pernicious because when we don't understand, we prohibit. So we prohibited the sacred rituals and ceremonies, the religious practices, language, the right to educate your children, to practice your own medicine, to wear your own clothes, to sing your own songs, to choose your own hairstyle. We took that all away, or tried to, just like we took the land. And that's the crux of the trauma. We killed people and we took land, which was traumatic but familiar. That had been going on the world over and long before Europeans ever arrived on these shores. The people versus the enemy, stealing each other's children, enslaving each other's captives, killing each other's warriors pushing each other off the land. That's the history of human beings on this earth. We just took it to a new level. And we did something different. We did something more. In addition to killing people and taking land, we took culture and identity. And that was unfamiliar. And we didn't take it like the land to make it our own. We took it like murder to destroy it. That's the trauma, and that's what's still going on today. We haven't succeeded, though, and that's the, the resilience. The people are uh, continuing to preserve their culture, to rebuild their populations, to nurture their traditions, to rediscover their foods, practice their healing, and they're gaining political strength. There's an emerging movement in Indian country that culture is prevention. That naming ceremonies actually do prevent heart disease. That tradition and community do support and sustain health and healthful behaviors. That connecting people to culture and heritage saves lives by building esteem, by grounding values, by creating belonging and purpose and pride. The movement is building against all the failed policies of the past two centuries. Allotment, assimilation, relocation, boarding schools, termination, all our best practices, all done our way, all failures. We've gotten it so wrong for so long, one failure after another, creating quite a bit of misery along the way, and yet we continue to think that we know what's best. And we keep imposing our terms. Religion is done this way. This is food. Education happens this way. This is the way governance works. This is what a constitution looks like. This is the way you'll do it, our way. This is another aspect of name. 
commodity canned beef. I was visiting friends on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation this summer, and I uh, had breakfast at Kathy Highhawk's uh, home. This is Kathy. Um, her t-shirt depicts uh, some Lakota ledger art of a buffalo hunt. You can't see it, but uh, the title is Fast Food. <laughs> so Kathy always has a big crowd at her house for meals. Uh, people sit around the table, they stand around the room, they take their food and go outside. I was sitting at the table and the plate of fried eggs came around and I took some. The plate of saltine crackers came around and I took some. And then uh, a bowl of something I didn't recognize came around. It didn't look good. It didn't smell good. I didn't take any. I just passed it on. Well, the bowl made its way uh, to the head of the table where Kathy's cousin Vine picked it up and brought it right back around to me. He put a spoonful of this stuff on my plate and he said, this is the meat your government gives us. You can't pass on this, you have to eat it. So I ate it, it tasted like rancid fish, and I thought, this is what my government says food is. My government removed access to buffalo, for example and replaced it with this. Separating people from their land and their culture means separating people from their food. And for 150 years, this or worse is what we've provided instead. It's gotten a lot better recently, but this has been the state of the art for a long time. Separating people from their food is particularly harmful. It harms the spirit as well as health. It's demoralizing on a massive scale. One tenet of culture is prevention is returning the locus of control so that the people decide what food is. The failure of understanding might persist but it matters less if we're not dictating the terms. We get out of the way and the people decide what food is, how religion works, how government works, how education is delivered, how health care is delivered. The people take the traditions and the innovations that work for them, just as they always have, adapting, innovating, incorporating the new, even as they are reclaiming their identity, strengthening their culture, and defining themselves and their practices on their own terms. I'm guessing that you're all with me, that you all think buffalo is better than commodity canned beef. And you probably think if the people want to have a naming ceremony, no reason for our government to have an opinion about it, much less pass a law against it. But I'm guessing I'm going to lose you when I extend that self-determination to our work, to CDC grants, for example. We're CDC after all, and we're really smart, but is it really our call for people and cultures we don't understand to decide what the evidence-based practices are, to set the goals, to monitor the progress? Why wouldn't we say, we don't really understand what works? You give it a go. You do what you know works. We'll provide the resources. We'll provide any assistance you ask for. But you decide what you're going to do. And if you fail, no worries. We have centuries of experience with failure. Just keep trying. In the 1950s, the people numbered fewer than 400,000. Today, there are more than four million American Indians and Alaska Natives in this country. That's resilience. In the 1950s, the people were prohibited from speaking their languages. Today, many Native children attend language immersion programs in their tribally run schools. That's resurgence. 
The past 20 years have seen an explosion of hunting, fishing, and gathering rites, and the integration of Western and traditional healing. Today, native-owned businesses provide salmon and bison to the food distribution program on Indian reservations. That's resurgence. The American Indian Freedom of Religion Act was signed into law in 1978. We finally got out of the way. Today, most Indian Health Service dollars go directly to tribes to deliver their own health care. We're getting out of the way. Last year, Congress gave USDA authority to pilot a process for tribal organizations to purchase and distribute uh, their, their own food, to make those decisions for themselves. We're taking a step to the side. This resurgence isn't happening because the US government started implementing evidence-based practices or because we suddenly really did know what's best. It's happening because American Indian and Alaska Natives are asserting themselves, connecting to their culture, demanding the right to define who they are, and creating progress on their own terms. We can follow on by investing our resources in what the people know will keep their people strong, by providing the assistance they request, and checking in to see the great work they're doing to thrive on their own terms. And when we check in, maybe we can call the people by the names they call themselves, because enemy, destroyer, snake, really don't describe these remarkable resilient people. Thank you. So what is CDC doing specifically to address some of these historical inequities? So CDC is not doing enough to address these historical inequities. We have a lot to do, in, uh, a lot more to do in terms of uh, greater investment of resources and we have a lot more to do in terms of engagement and listening and empowering so that we can uh, deploy our resources to the greatest effect. And uh, which program in Chronic should we rename with an awesome native name? <laughs> well, I don't use the word Chronic. That's a street name for marijuana. Oh. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I would Wish rename my center to the National Center for <laughs> Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. How's that? I said corrected. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.